You can open your Bibles to John 17. John 17. How do you explain how do you explain the short-lived disciple? How do you explain the short-lived disciple? That's a question we started looking at last week, except we looked at it under that question, what do you do with Judas? What do you do with Judas? How do you explain the short-lived disciple? Jesus at one point gave a parable where he indicated that there's different ways in which individuals receive the gospel. The idea of seed and soil, the idea that you could preach the gospel, there's no problem with the seed, the gospel is pure, the gospel is right, but the problem is the nature of and the condition of people's hearts. And so that pure gospel can uh, hit somebody's heart who has a hard heart and it just kind of bounces right off. No response, no care, uh, no sensitivity to the gospel at all. There's others who hear the gospel and they seem to receive it, but the fact of the matter is they get all kinds of other cares and affections in their life and all these things choke out that gospel which otherwise would germinate and they don't uh, believe or they continue for a short amount of time and it just kind of gets all choked out. There's also those others who receive the gospel uh, and it seems as if they respond. I mean, excitement, growth, passion. So excited about the gospel, so excited about their newfound faith. They want to share it with others. They want to evangelize. But then it becomes apparent that there's a cost to salvation. You know, it's not all about you. The fact of the matter is you need to put Christ before yourself. you got to put Christ before others. Maybe some persecution arises. And then that one who was once passionate and continued for a time and seemed so promising, like there's real life there, just fizzles out and dies. And then, of course, we have those on with that sensitive heart, and God engenders that faith, and it takes root, and then there's growth, and not just growth, but fruit, and that's that genuine believer. But what do we do with that shallow-hearted hearer who continues for a time, and it appears as if, from all observances, that there's growth, but then they fizzle out? How do we explain this? Well, we said last time that some people explain this by saying that that individual was saved, but then lost their salvation. We touched on a little bit last week as to why that's not biblical. We're going to explain that a little bit further this week. But I want you to think about this also before we get into John 17. There are some people who will explain a short-lived disciple not by saying that they had their salvation and lost it, but some people want to create an entirely new category of believers who do not continue on into a life of spiritual fruit, don't really seem to show signs of spiritual desire, but because at some point in their lives they made a commitment to Jesus, they are a genuine believer, but they're a fruitless believer. Hmm. Well, just like the Bible doesn't support the idea that somebody can get saved and then lose their salvation, it also doesn't support the idea that somebody can be a believer without producing spiritual fruit. And so, have you ever heard somebody say, well, that individual is a Christian, but they are a carnal Christian? You ever heard that phrase before? Uh, or, I mean, it's the idea that you could have an undiscipled disciple, or a non following follower, or an unchrist like Christian. It doesn't really make any sense at all. Yet, people create whole extra biblical categories to explain the one who seems to have been saved, but then doesn't show any fruit. These are those who are unwilling to accept the prevalence of false converts. Maybe have no category for the momentary disciple. And so they go to great lengths to assure the uncommitted disciple that they are indeed saved. And by the way, this becomes an issue when you approach the gospel this way. You know, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe He died for your sins on the cross? Yes. Do you believe He rose from the dead? Yes. Okay, pray this prayer. One, two, three, pray this prayer. Just repeat after me. You get them to repeat some words, pray a prayer, and then assure them of their salvation, even though they go on to produce absolutely no spiritual fruit whatsoever. That type of easy believism, that quick prayerism, that cheap faith, that leads somebody to pray some type of prayer and then assure them of their salvation regardless of any evidence, uh, subsequent evidence of genuine salvation. As a consequence of that, the world is confused as to who are genuine Christians and who are not. And also the church is confused. 
seeking to grapple with those who seem to continue for a time, but then fall off. But God in his wisdom has designed our faith so that genuine salvation will be proven, but it will be proven over time. Not by what somebody says in a moment, not by somebody praying a prayer, but it will be proven over time. One way that God has done this is by designing the faith in such a way that it will invite cost. Sometimes it will invite persecution so that if you have identified with Jesus Christ, then others will begin to treat you like Jesus Christ. And then how do you respond? Then how do you respond once you begin to pay a price for your identification with Jesus? A false believer oftentimes will be exposed. He'll turn back to the world. He'll turn back to his former lifestyle. He'll forsake Christ. In contrast to the person who forsakes Jesus, however, when their faith costs them, the one who is a genuine believer, what? Continues in the faith. They continue in the faith. The mark of a genuine believer is continuance. That is, they follow. Jesus said in John 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. What does that following look like? Well, Matthew 16, 24, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It's pretty clear to know who's actually following Jesus because they're denying themselves and uh, they're putting Christ first. Matthew 10, 30, 37, Whoever loves his father or mother more than me, he says, is not worthy of me. Christ becomes a preeminent love. Christ becomes a preeminent relationship. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Why? Because if son or daughter says, Mom, Dad, I, I don't want you to follow Jesus. I don't like these new changes in your life. Are you going to capitulate to those pressures and then forsake Christ? Or are you going to say that Jesus uh, comes first? He says, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That is, the whole life then is dedicated to Christ. Christ is preeminent in affection, preeminent in relationship. The genuine disciple of Christ denies self and exalts Christ. That type of person can endure persecution. They can endure the cost. They're willing to pay the price of identification with Jesus. His priority is not life, a life of comfort or ease or fleshly fulfillment. Christ is the center of his life. His ultimate priority is to please him. So, we know that we're going to be exposed to those who continue in the faith for a time, like we said last week, who continue in faith for a time, but then fall away. This can be confusing for some. Some may come under the mistaken notion that such people were genuinely saved and then lost their salvation, or that, you know what, there's some other category for a fruitless believer. Well, the fact of the matter is, according to 1 John 2.19, if such individuals were genuinely saved, they would continue in the faith. Now, there's a distinction here. We say not if they continued in the faith, they would be a genuine believer. But we say if they are a genuine believer, they would continue in the faith. We're going to flesh that out. Are we saying, well, Christians are such good people, such a cut above that any real Christian would never fall back into sin and forsake Jesus? That's not what we're saying. What we're going to learn this morning is that a genuine Christian is one who is saved by God's grace, yes, but also kept by God's grace. A genuine believer is entirely secure in his salvation because God himself is sustaining his faith and keeping him all the way to the end. Now we come to John 17. In John 17, we're going to learn how we are kept in the faith. We're going to learn how it is that we continue and are able to follow Jesus uh, all the way to the end of our lives or till his coming. This is going to be a glimpse behind the scenes of how eternal security works. How is it that we can say a genuine believer is absolutely secure in his salvation and will never lose that salvation? John 17, verse 11 through 18. This is Jesus praying to the Father. One of the most amazing passages in all of the New Testament because we get to a glimpse behind the divine curtain to see the Son praying to the Father. This 
inter-Trinitarian conversation happening. And you know what the subject is? You and me. John 17, verse 11. Jesus says, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Now, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because in verse 20, after Jesus prays, he says this. He says, I do not ask for these only, that is, his disciples that were around him, the twelve, better the eleven, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And the reason I make that distinction is because you can see yourself in this prayer. We are those who have responded to the apostolic doctrine, right? So this prayer is not just for the immediate 11. This prayer is for all those who would believe uh, at the apostolic doctrine uh, through their preaching of the gospel. So that is all of us as well, okay? So, so I say that at the beginning to say, when you read this, understand it's not just the 11, it's you too, you and I, okay? I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. What we see, first of all, in this text, I mean, there's so much to unpack here in John 17. And the purpose of this is not to do a detailed exposition of John 17, but simply to hone in on one theme that we see. And that is how we are kept in the faith, how we can say that we are eternally secure if we are genuine believers. And what we see, first of all, is that we are eternally secure in our salvation because we are kept by the power of God. We are kept by the power of God. Look in verse 11, Jesus prays to the Father, Father, keep them in your name. Verse 12, he says to the Father, while I was with them, I kept them. In your name. And then verse 15, he says to the Father, I'm praying that you keep them from the evil one. Father, you take the initiative. Exercise your divine action, your divine power to keep them, to guard them. What he's saying is, Father, keep them loyal to you, keep them in your name. Don't allow their faith to fail. And if you look up a little bit, we get to see what he's asking the Father to keep them faithful to. Look in verse 1 of John 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. This is such a precious passage because it's so incredibly clear as Jesus prays to the Father and says, my mission is accomplished because those you gave me have believed these things. If you want to know what you must believe in order to be saved, this is a good place to go because you get to see what Jesus classifies as his mission being accomplished. They have believed that have come from you, They have believed that everything I have has been given to me from you and so on. And you can just go there and make bullet points and say, these are the things that must be believed in order for one to be saved. But it also shows us what things a believer then, a genuine believer remains faithful to, showing us evidence of genuine salvation. So Jesus taught his disciples who God was. Jesus taught his disciples what the character of God was and how God had orchestrated salvation through Jesus alone. 
Jesus also taught and lived and revealed that all his own power and authority came from the Father. He reveals that all power and all authority had been given to him for the purpose of salvation. Jesus also did all that the Father instructed him to do in order that his disciples chosen out of the world might be fully convinced that he was sent from the Father. So he was sent by the Father, he's sealed by the Father, or attested to by the Father that he is the one who is the source of eternal salvation. So Jesus' disciples came to believe that he was the Son of God, the Christ, and Jesus is praying to the Father, Father, keep them in that belief. Keep them holding that conviction. Don't allow them to depart from the faith. Don't permit them to renounce that confession. Don't per- permit them to renounce the confession that I am the Christ, the Son of God, or to turn away from trusting me as their Savior or from submitting to me as their Lord. What an amazing prayer. Jesus, the Son of God, praying to the Heavenly Father, and there you have Father and Son together, both members of the Trinity, working to do what? To keep us secure in the faith. What does this say then about those who profess faith in Jesus Christ and maintain that faith and trust their entire lives? What it says of those individuals is that God has kept them in the faith. What it says of those individuals is that the Father has answered the prayer of the Son, that these would not fail. And with this, we find an amazing tension. We see biblically that Christians are told, number one, to work out your salvation. Work it out. We're told to hold fast your confession to the end. But simultaneously, we're told that it's God and God alone who sustains the faith that is then able to work out that salvation all the way to the end and to hold that confession all the way to the end. Peter picks up this tension in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. It's a work of God. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. It's secure, it's reserved, it's kept. Verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Look at the language there. An inheritance reserved, kept in heaven for you. Who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith. I mean, this is security here. But what does that mean there in verse 5 where it says, who, by God's power, are being guarded? We could understand that. But who, by God's power, are are being guarded by faith? Well, whose faith? God's faith? No, not God's faith. He says that we are being guarded by our faith. Interesting. The idea is that those who are genuine believers will make it all the way to the end to inherit that inheritance that is being kept for us, is being reserved there. So God is simultaneously reserving the inheritance of eternal life while also guarding individuals so that through their continuance in the faith, they will make it all the way to the end. God keeps the inheritance, but then God keeps his people for the inheritance. Absolutely amazing. But God's power keeping us or guarding us through faith also indicates that you and I have a role in this. Because what will the evidence be that one is being guarded by God's power through faith? There's going to be tangible expressions of that faith. There's going to be fruit, evidence that there is genuine faith there. So God's power, yes. God guarding us, yes, but through faith. And so the evidence of God's guarding work will be fruit of faith. So again, we have attention. God sustains a persevering faith in all whom he has caused to be born again. Say that again. God sustains a persevering faith in all whom he has caused to be born again. That's, first of all, where our security lies. We are kept by the power of God. Genuine believers continue in the faith. 
They maintain their confession of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They remain trusting Him and Him alone as Savior from sin. They continually submit to Christ as Lord. They follow Him their entire lives. Their faith remains. However, that faithfulness is ultimately the product of God's faithfulness. He is the one who's guarding. He is the one who's sustaining. He is the one who keeps us in the truth. And according to John 17, he's doing all of that as an answer to the prayer of Jesus. And that's what we see next. We see, number one, we are, if you're a believer, if you're a genuine believer, you are absolutely secure in your salvation because of the power of God. Number two, we are kept secure in our salvation through the intercession of the Son. Through the intercession of the Son. Those whom God the Father has given to Christ are kept eternally. Christ intercedes on their behalf, praying that God the Father would keep us. That's the whole point of this prayer in John 17. This is the Son interceding, saying, Father, keep them. Father, keep them. Father, keep them. Was that just a one-time thing where Jesus just prayed that one time in John 17 that the Father would keep his people in the faith? No. What we find in the book of Hebrews is that this is the ongoing ministry of Jesus Christ. Even today, Christ is praying and interceding for those who belong to him, saying, Father, keep them. Keep them in the faith. Keep them faithful. The writer of Hebrews again brings this out and presents Jesus as the perfect mediator. Unlike the priests in the under the old covenant who would have to continually offer sacrifices which only temporarily covered their uh, covered sin and they would have to offer sacrifices for their own sin first and and so on and these priests who would eventually die and their priesthood would end in contrast Jesus is an eternal priest who offered himself as a final sacrifice which takes away sin completely but his priesthood continues on forever because he's eternal and he continually functions on our behalf as our high priest we see this in hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 it says consequently he is able to save to the uttermost he accomplishes salvation fully and completely and he brings us all the way to the end He brings us all the way to that point of glorification. He can do that. He's able. Now, consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Isn't this interesting? I mean, have you had a conception of salvation, which is Christ accomplished salvation on the cross? We said it is finished. Yes, it's done. And Christ sat down. Okay, say it was all done. There's no more work to be done. Well, there is no more work to be done to accomplish our salvation in that sense of the redemptive plan. But what we find here in Hebrews 7 is that Christ still has an active function here. He continually intercedes for you and I. Why is it that when you find yourself succumbing to sin and temptation and you go through that season of sin and temptation, you, you have that experience of Romans chapter 7 where you're just, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I end up doing, and you just cry out and say, oh, wretched man or wretched woman that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And you say, I thank God through Jesus Christ. How is it that you, you don't succumb to the temptation and just flip over to the world and say, I'm done with Christ. I want to fulfill my passions of my flesh. How is it that you get to that point and say, oh, wretched man that I am. And then your eyes are cast upon Jesus and you say, I thank God through Jesus. How is it that we get to that point? Because Jesus Christ is praying to the Father, don't allow their faith to fail. Don't allow their faith to fail. Keep them in the faith. And just like Peter, who denied Jesus three times and then confesses three times that he loved him, and Jesus says, when you're converted, right, uh, he says, feed my sheep, lead my people, right? Uh, how, how, how does that happen? Because Jesus prayed for him. Like Satan would have you to sift you like me, but I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Jesus is interceding for your faith and my faith constantly. And that is the reason why we are sustained in our faith. The longer you're saved, the more you understand how wretched you are, right? Is this your experience? The longer you're saved, the more wretched you understand you are. The more that you're saved, the more you realize how dependent you are upon Jesus. The, more that you're, the longer you're saved, the, the more uh, you understand how desperately you need his continuing intercession for your faith. 
He makes continual intercession for us because we must be continually kept. I mean, you've heard it said before, if you could lose your salvation, you would. Like, instantly. It's true that our salvation has wholly and completely and finally been accomplished by Jesus, and it cannot be lost, and it's a divine guarantee, but that does not mean that God is not continually active in keeping our faith. Romans chapter 5, verse 9 says, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, like that's done, declared righteous by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we are enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. The fact that Christ has risen and that there's resurrection life, and that's current. That's not some past event. Christ is alive, and he is what? He's sustaining our spiritual life. What does the Bible say? He is the vine, we are the branches. What is that? Well, we are so connected to Christ, he is the source of our spiritual life, which, which we, which, with, from which we continually draw spiritual sustenance. And the only, only reason we have any spiritual life at all is because of our connection to him. If we're saved by his death, what he accomplished at a point in time, how much the more are we then saved by his life? We see this truth again regarding the resurrected Christ in Romans 8, verse 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. As much as we look back to his death and say, how wonderful is that? We're so dependent upon the death of Christ. Well, you realize that what's continuing is our ongoing dependence upon his life as he intercedes for us. Paul continues, he is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. And you know, the answer to all that is no, none of these things can separate us. But what does this say? He's interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This is the daily experience of genuine believers. Because Christ loves you, he's interceding for you. And nothing can separate you from his love. Nothing can separate us because he's continually interceding, keeping us in the faith. And again, we see that vivid illustration with Peter. Satan would have you to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. We will be saved finally in the end, yes, as a divine guarantee, because Christ is living and making intercession. Nothing can thwart Christ's power or his plan for our security. John 10, 28, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. He's saying, they're, they're in my hand. This is my work. I'm doing this. You say, well, you can snatch yourself out of his hand. Have you heard that before? Well, yeah, but you can just snatch yourself out. Well, wait a second, what about all these verses we just looked at indicating that Christ keeps us secure via his intercession so that our faith will not fail? So we are kept in his hand by a sustained faith, which is the product of his work. So no, you can't snatch yourself out of his hand because that would be indicating that his prayers go unheard and unanswered. So, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one's able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So you get the power of Christ, you get the power of the Father. Christ is praying to the Father, the Father's answering. And so if one can lose their salvation, you're simply saying that God is impotent. God is not powerful enough. God does not hear the prayer of the Son. The Son's prayers are not effective, and they can't do it. Nevertheless, we must realize that our eternal destiny is secure, but that does not mean that it does not now in some way require our efforts in that he keeps us through a sustained faith and faith works, right? Not for salvation, but as a product of salvation. Jesus sustains that work. He sustains our faith. Jesus, of whom the writer of Hebrews says, upholds the universe by the word of his power. And of whom Paul says, all things hold together. He is the one in whom our faith is upheld all the way to the last day. What God creates, God sustains. What God creates, God sustains. He's not the blind watchmaker who made all of creation and just let it go. Uh, No, he sustains all of creation, and what he creates spiritually, he also sustains. God upholds our faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. 
that in every way you were enriched in Him in all speech, in all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. Saying you're, you're believers, right? You're believers. So that you're not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait, await, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look what he says next. Who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of His Son, Christ Jesus our Lord. How is it that a genuine believer makes it all the way to the end and is not that short-lived disciple, is not the Judas, but perseveres because it is the Father who sustains us all the way to the end. What He creates, He sustains. Philippians 1.6, I'm sure of this, that He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, to say that somebody can lose their salvation is nothing less than attacking the power and ability of God. God says, this is, this, is, this is my realm, right? Part of the Christian life is understanding what belongs to the realm of God's power and His working and what belongs to the realm of our power and our working and not confusing those things. And what He's saying is, this is me. This is what I do. I create and I sustain. So to say that one can lose their salvation is to say that uh, my determination to sin is greater than God's ability to keep. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 uh, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. And you say, well, that sounds like quite a task. I don't know if I can do that, Paul, uh, to keep my whole spirit and soul and body blameless all the way to the coming of Jesus. I don't know that I could do that. Well, you're right, you can't. So he says, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. He will surely do it. We are kept by the power of God. We are kept by the intercession of the Son. And next of all, we are kept through the sanctification of the Word and Spirit. We are kept through the sanctification of the Word and Spirit. Look at verse 14 of John 17. Jesus says to the Father, I have given them your Word. The world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Not only is God actively sustaining us in the faith through his own power and grace, and not only is Jesus interceding for us and praying that our faith would not fail, But the Holy Spirit is actively working through the Word of God to cleanse us, to make us more like Jesus, and to prepare us for His coming. And this is maybe a fine point. This is essential to understand in so many aspects of our salvation and our sanctification. When we say that God is working and God is keeping us and it's all within His power, that does not mean that He does not work through means. That is, he uses things in order to accomplish his sustaining work. And he's going to use those things without fail. And that's what we call the means of grace. And here in John 17, Jesus specifically speaks of the word. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. How will God the Father keep those who belong to Jesus in the faith? Well, in part, he's going to do it by this progressive work of sanctifying them in the Word of God, in the truth. And you say, well, where's the Spirit here? I said that we're kept by the sanctifying work of the Word and Spirit. Well, where's the Spirit in John 17? Remember when Paul gives us that passage on spiritual armor? And we have one offensive weapon, and it's the Word of God. How does he describe the Word of God? It is the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God is only ever made effective in the life of the believer through the work of the Holy Spirit. It's only made effective through the work of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth, what we understand then is the Spirit who's making the word effective in the life of believers uh, in their sanctification. Jesus said in John 14, verse 25, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit... Whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. This is the Holy Spirit's realm. To take the word of God as a means of grace and to change us, to form us into the image of Christ through it. 
The word is entirely sufficient to provide all that we need to live a godly life and to grow in the faith and to remain faithful. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable, Paul says to Timothy, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So, I say that there's a tension, because we understand that all this happens through the power of God alone. He sustains us. He maintains our faith. It's all within His realm of operation. But on the other hand, we understand that He uses means to do this one of them being the Word of God. And that's going to bring us to our next point. We're kept by the power of God the Father. We are kept by the intercession of the Son. We are kept by the sanctification of the Word and Spirit. And lastly, we're kept through the perseverance of our own faith. We're kept through the perseverance of our own faith. We're participants in all of this. You don't sit back and say, Oh, Lord, I know it's all your work, so just... Keep me secure. Keep me blameless. No, the Holy Spirit cannot use the Word of God in our lives unless we expose ourselves to the Word of God in our lives. We don't actively work by the power of the Holy Spirit by reading the Word and studying the Word and meditating upon the Word and applying the Word and obeying the Word. All that sounds like effort. All of that sounds like discipline. Uh, But this is how God maintains our faith. The genuine believer will, by the Holy Spirit, read and apply and memorize and meditate upon and obey the Word of God. God uses means. So we are kept through the perseverance of our own faith. He daily upholds us, yes, in response to Christ's intercession for us, yes. But there's a practical manifestation of that. There's evidence that God is answering Christ's prayer, and that looks like a continuance in the faith. Is it entirely the work of God? Yes. But do we play a role in this? Yes. Is it entirely a work of God? Yes. But do we have a role in it? Yes. What, how does that all work together? Not exactly sure, but we know the Bible teaches both. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Be faithful to the means. Read the Word of God. Have a prayer life. Attend worship. Have some accountability to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Participate in the Lord's table. Get all those means of grace functioning in your life. And if you're here this morning and you're saying, I'm going through a rough time, I don't know why I keep giving into sin and temptation and so on, like do a means of grace check. Do a means check. This ought to be a discipline in our lives. Okay, how am I interacting with the means of grace? How am I interacting with the Word? What's my prayer life look like? What kind of fellowship do I have with believers? Am I faithful to attending uh, uh, corporate worship? Am I participating in the Lord's table as intended? And so on and so on and so on. Do a means check. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But then he says, for... So these are the grounds... So, so our work is grounded in this reality. I'm going to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. So personal effort, personal discipline, yes. Habits, yes. For, this is what's going to encourage you to keep doing it. From this grounds, keep doing that. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Okay, so I'm not teaching two incompatible truths and just trying to force them together, right? Because Paul here in one verse gives us both truths and doesn't try at all to try to reconcile them at all, but he says, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. So with the confidence that God is using these means in your life to keep you secure in the faith, from that confidence, put in some effort here. Read the Word. Pray. Have good, spiritually encouraging relationships. Use all the means. Read, study, obey. Even submit. Trust that God is keeping you, but that does not, that is not divorced from our effort because our effort is the outworking or the evidence that it is God who is sustaining. Work all that out. I don't know. But what we see on one hand is that this is all God's work, and on the other hand, we see evidence that it requires our effort because 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Well, now we're talking about sports. That's a sweaty ordeal. So run that you may obtain it. 
Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. God, keep me in the faith. Okay, well, you exercise some self-control too. What do we know? Well, it's all going to be by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but you got to do that. Yeah, and at the end of the day, we realize I can only do it because of the Holy Spirit. He continues, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable, so I do not run aimlessly. Could you imagine there's some race? And you got these guys, and the, the gun goes off, and they start running, and one of these guys just starts aimlessly wandering around, right? Uh, he says, I don't, I, don't, I don't run aimlessly. He's got a goal. He knows the path to take. He says, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body. I keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I should be disqualified. Discipline, hard work, self-control, self-denial, that's all within the realm of what is expected of us. But based upon everything we've already seen, we see that when that happens, it's only the product of God sustaining, or we could say it's actually the evidence of God sustaining work in our lives. That's why we encounter so many scriptures that seem to indicate we must like endure to the end. Matthew 10, 22 says, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Luke 8, 15 with the parable of the soils. As for that in the good soil, they are those who hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. Certainly sounds like they're doing all the work, holding fast to that salvation. So, is it God who does this, or is it us? The answer is yes. Jude 21 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal glory. But then a few verses later, he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling... And to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, and dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. On one hand, keep yourselves in the love of God. On the other hand, praise God because he's the one who's able to keep you from stumbling. Paul understood this tension, obviously, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's all his grace. What's some of the evidence of God's grace in Paul's life? What is some of the evidence of God's grace? By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. What's the evidence that the grace was not bestowed upon Paul in vain? On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Isn't that interesting? Evidence that God is at work in my life, that his grace is that I worked. I worked harder. Well, what did that look like? Well, we already saw in 1 Corinthians 9, it looked like discipline. It looked like a determined athlete. It looked like getting your body in line. It looked like denying yourself, right? Uh, Okay, so he worked harder than any of them. And that, to Paul, was evidence that God's grace was at work in his life. And then he says, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. That's what I say. We're not, we're not pitting, you know, taking a verse over here and a verse over here and saying, well, here it seems to talk about God sustaining us. And over here, it seems to talk about the fact that we need to work to sustain our own faith. And uh, the Bible's contradicting itself. And now here's this guy out there trying to reconcile these things that are impossible to reconcile. Listen, Paul is giving it to us in one verse. God's grace is evident in my life. What's the evidence? I worked harder than any of them. But it wasn't me who was working. It was the grace of God that was working in me. That's it. That's the tension. He told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. He's talking about the passions of the flesh and so on, and the quarreling and so on. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you are called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Flee, he says. Fight, he says. Take hold, he says. That's our role. And then at the end of the day, say, thank you, God, for your grace in my life that has enabled me to flee and to take hold, and so on. So, is that us, or is that Christ living in us? Well, it's both. When Jesus prays to the Father, Father, don't allow their faith to fail. Keep them in your name. Keep them in the faith. That's going to look like something. It's going to look like an individual who's fighting that fight of faith. He's given us his grace, and by it we live a life that pleases him. Anything that I do that pleases him is all by his grace, and he receives all the glory. So I can labor, and I can strive, I can fight the fight of faith, but any spiritual progress that I make is entirely due to his grace. 
and His Spirit within me who enables us. Constantly, we can labor by, the God, by God's grace and give Him all the praise. So in conclusion, we will encounter those in this life who claim to believe in Jesus and follow Him for a time, only to re- later renounce their faith. Do we say they were saved and then unsaved? They lost their salvation? Listen, that is such... Like the Bible is... A, it's not even... Uh, it's not obscure at all in the New Testament. Uh, those who claim you can be saved and lose your salvation are ignoring a host of clear biblical passages and just frankly have a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of God and salvation. Or do we create a category and say, well, somebody who seems to have renounced the faith, but I know that at one point they seem to be saved, so maybe we create a new category and say they're just a carnal Christian that just doesn't have any fruit in their lives. Both those things won't do because they're not consistent with what Scripture teaches. We will encounter those who hear the gospel and respond with joy and excitement only to quickly fall away when it becomes apparent that following Christ brings a cost. That's true. We will encounter those who start out well, appearing to believe, continuing for a time, only to be drawn away by the cares of the world and relationships and money and pleasures and so on. We're going to experience that. So how do we answer these things? We're not going to say they lost their salvation. We're not going to say that they are genuine followers of Jesus who are now lost. We can't say that. To say those things is to say that the Spirit has failed, the Son has failed, the Father has failed. So we can't go there. What we're going to say is what John says in 1 John 2, verse 19. And you're going to be like, why didn't you just start here? Because you could have just read this verse and that was it. But they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Well, there it is. They went out from us because they were not of us, and if they had been of us, they wouldn't have gone out. There you go. The Bible teaches, however, more than the fact that our eternal destiny is secured at the moment of salvation. It also teaches that with that salvation, God has given the ability and endurance for us to remain in the faith until our death or the coming of Jesus Christ. That's part of that whole package of salvation. Salvation is not a matter of, okay, eternity is secured, and that's it. Salvation is you have been given a new nature, and by His Holy Spirit, you've been granted a persevering faith, which will keep you all the way to that eternal inheritance. So Jesus could say in John 8, verse 31, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in Him, If you abide in My word, you are truly My disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Christ was teaching that with genuine salvation comes a faithful continuance a keeping of his commands, a life of following him, that's the mark of a genuine disciple. Anything less than that is evidence that one's salvation is deficient, it's false, and they're not saved at all. So genuine salvation is accompanied with a God-empowered endurance. He keeps us, and he does it by producing in us spiritual desires, spiritual stamina, a faithful continuance in following Christ. Again, that's not our work. It's the work of God but it's not divorced from our effort. Our effort does not contribute to it, uh, except that evidence is the fact that God is at work in us. A genuine believer will show evidence that God is performing this work in them, just as God has created and sustains the universe. When God creates faith, He sustains faith in believers. The evidence of His creative work in nature is all around us, yes, and it's obvious that all things are being sustained by Him. Likewise, those who have become new creations in Christ will show evidence of being sustained by God the Father all the way to the end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your sustaining work. Lord, help us to get it right. Help us to have a biblically informed understanding of the nature of salvation and sanctification. There are a few different facets to our understanding of salvation that to the human mind at first glance may seem contradictory, which has led us to try to 
find other explanations instead of accepting the biblical tension. So help us instead to be good students of Scripture, to be theologically sound, to not try to create entire new categories to understand salvation and sanctification because of uh, our experiences of individuals proclaiming Christ and then denouncing Christ. Help us instead to accept what the Bible teaches. And so this morning we recognize that our faith is sustained by you. We understand that the reason we don't go back to our old lives, the reasons we don't ultimately renounce Jesus, the reason we remain faithful at all is because Jesus is interceding for us and you are hearing his prayer and through his prayer and your answer, you then sustain our faith. And we see that practically. We see evidence of that work uh, through our faithful endurance. Sin, sinning at times, yeah, uh, but repentance, recognizing our wretchedness and resting more and more on Jesus and his mercy. We see the evidence of that sustaining faith in our lives as we avail ourselves to your means, as we love your word, as we love our fellow believers, as we engage in and join with the fellowship of a corporate body. And uh, Lord, help us just to get it right. Help us to see it in our own lives. When we find ourselves faltering, find ourselves succumbing to sin and temptation, on one hand, help us to not so quickly doubt our salvation. Uh, Help us to recognize that even genuine believers still are subject at times to the passions of the flesh. Help us instead of Doubting our own salvation, help us instead to look to Jesus. Instead of becoming despondent at our own frailties, help us to become encouraged at the strength of Jesus. So help us to handle our own faults and failures that way and to find security not in our own effort, but in the intercession and the work of Jesus. On the other hand, I pray that you protect us from ever creating a category which smiles upon the idea of a fruitless believer someone who claims to have received Jesus but has gone on with no spiritual desire, no ongoing repentance, uh, no availing themselves to your means. Uh, Help us to not uh, permit uh, that category either, so help us to get that balance right. So now, Lord, we just pray for those this morning uh, who may be struggling with sin in their lives. Help them, yeah, to be convicted. Help them to repent of that sin to recognize their own frailties, yeah, but then to rely upon Jesus uh, for a sustained faith. And we also pray for those this morning who maybe aren't going through that type of season. Maybe they're thriving. Maybe they're in the means. uh, They're in the Word. they got a prayer life going on. They're growing. Help them to just return all that praise and thanks to you, understanding it's the product of your work alone and uh, that you are to receive all praise and glory for it. Help them never to think that it's the product of their own uh, goodness. And then lastly, we just pray for those here this morning who are not yet Christians. We pray that they'd come to see Jesus as the source of eternal life, as the one sent by you, and the one uh, in whom they are to trust and submit. And we pray for those who may be self-deceived, may be claiming to be believers, maybe they prayed a prayer at some point in their lives, but the fact of the matter is there's no genuine spiritual life. I pray that you'd reveal that to these individuals, that they could be genuinely saved. Lord, we thank you for this and for all that you've done for us through your Son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.